Hi, everyone, and welcome. We're, uh, we're going to wait a few minutes before we get started here. But as we're waiting, why don't you all tell us where you're coming from so we get you so we can get to a little bit uh, know you guys better in the chat. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, please. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So as we're we're going to wait a few minutes before we get started, but yeah, perfect. Oh, cool. North Carolina, that's Tony. <laughs> that's me. Yeah. I wanted yeah. to kick people off and kick it off. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone. Please put it in, put it in your chat. Let us know where you are. I'd love to shout you out. Perfect. Yeah. So as we're getting started here, yeah, please write where you're coming from in the chat box so we can get to know you guys a little bit better. Perfect. Perfect. Texas. Amazing. Hi, Roy. <laughs> All right. Center Texas. Roy, is that is that because it's in the center of the state? Or that yeah. that's not it's, it's not geographic center. It's just center because it's center. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, Welcome, Alberta, Julie, our neighbors Florida. in the north. Welcome. Wow. We're Welcome. all over North America. Amazing. All right, Anna Marie. I mean, Anna Marie. Oh, Anna Maria, Florida. Oh, that's an interesting town name. Anna Maria, Florida. Cheryl. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. So Roy is center uh, center of the county. We're in deep East Texas. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Center of the county, it's the county seat. Is it? Is it the county seat? The center, of the county seat of Center County, Montreal. Another one. Yeah. All right, Roy. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. From Quebec as well. All right. We got two provinces. Welcome, our northern neighbors. Welcome. Perfect. Amazing. Hi, everybody. Hey, everybody. Put, let us know where you're from, please. Love to say hello. Perfect. So yeah, as we're. Uh... We're just a few more minutes before we get started here. Um, Alberta again. Wow, we got a lot of people in Alberta. Perfect. Ontario. Cool. All right. And uh, how cold is it uh, in M Montreal? Um, yeah. Calgary. Yeah. How cold? Like how much <laughs> snow is it? Is it? Uh, yeah. I was going to say, is it deadly? It's not deadly. Is it? Is it just very bad? Is it very bad? <laughs> oh, there's the contrast. Scottsdale, no yes. snow there. Oh, all right, Julie. Yes. Right. I'm from uh, Sudbury, Ontario. It's very cold up here. We got a lot of snow last Friday. Up to oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, you're on Ontario. All right. Yeah, perfect. Yep. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Yes. Arkansas, welcome. Some folks from the south, Arkansas, Florida, and right in the heartland, Des Moines, Iowa. The Iowa caucuses, everybody's paying attention to you. Everybody, well, everybody was. Now we moved on to North New Hampshire, right? But but you'll always you'll always be number one, Emily, right? <laughs> in, the, in the US presidential elections, Iowa will always be number one. It's some they have it worked out somehow. I don't know. I read an article about I, I don't know if it's statutory or something. They will they will always be number one in Iowa. Yeah. Two feet of snow. Yes. Well, we know because we were tracking your weather by the hour, Emily, because of the because of the caucuses. Perfect. Okay. State so law. you have to be first. Okay. <laughs> we don't want to violate <laughs> Iowa state law. Thank you, Emily. Cool. All right. Uh, we should get started. I'm sorry. Yes, okay. No, okay. Perfect. So thank you everyone for joining today um, and taking time of your busy schedules to be here. I am Stephanie Keel, marketing specialist. We also have Chelsea, our digital designer, helping us out on the tech side of things. So you might see her in the chat box answering some of your technical questions. So feel free to say hello to Chelsea. Before we get started, I just want to start today's session by acknowledging that Keel's head office is located in Vancouver, which is on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Miskewim, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, and give thanks for their generosity on these hospitality on these lands and waters. If you're new to Keel, welcome. Keel is a fundraiser CRM, meaning that it's that meaning that's designed with the unique of fundraisers in mind, aimed to unify communications, um, donor management, and fundraising into one single source of truth. Before we uh, before I introduce you to our expert speaker today, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Today's session is going to be about 45 minutes in length today with a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session at the end. Throughout the presentation, please feel to please feel free to write any questions you have in the chat box or the Q&A section, and we'll get to as many as we can by the end. Speaking of the chat box, please remember to select everyone when you type so that all our guests today can read your comments and questions. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive access to the recording and slide deck by the end of the week. So all out of the way, I'm pleased to welcome our expert speaker today, Tony, who is a lawyer, comedian, and planned giving evangelist, also the host of Nonprofit Radio. He's been supporting nonprofits and their planned giving initiatives for over 25 years. We're excited to have him here today. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Tony. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. Welcome, everybody. 
You know, I saw on Twitter that the average attention span, uh, X, pardon me, X, of course, X. The average attention span on X is about nine seconds. And I thought, that's enough time for my mother to create guilt. I'm coming over for dinner. Can't you stay for the night? I'm coming to stay for the night. Can't you stay for the weekend? I'm coming to stay for the weekend. Take me on a cruise. I'll take you on a cruise. Can't you move back home? I'll move back home. Let's get cemetery plots. Now, so on the first layer, of course, that's a little bit about motherly guilt. Uh, some of you may have experienced that in uh, in your lives. That's uh, something mothers uh, are uh, seem expert in sometimes. Um, but going a step uh, a little uh, to, to the next level, let's say, uh, it's about a deeper relationship, wanting a deeper relationship, right? And that's what I will hope for you today, that in debunking these nasty top five myths of planned giving, that you will be comfortable with planned giving. You'll launch planned giving at your nonprofit and you will then enjoy those deeper relationships. Welcome everyone again. Uh, did I just see uh, Arizona said uh, freezing 64 degrees? And then right after that, I saw somebody from Green Bay, Wisconsin. So we're not, they're not, the, the Green Bay is not laughing at your 64 degrees in Arizona joke being cold. Um, Stephanie, thank you very much for your help and everything leading up to today. Chelsea, thank you very much for your help today. And my thanks also to Kila for, for sponsoring Kila Labs. I will share and we will get started. All righty, we're gonna debunk these nasty, insidious top five myths. And this is how we're gonna do it. We'll take a look at the what and why of planned giving to make sure everybody's level playing field, same page, whatever whatever metaphor you like to use for everybody being parallel tracks. There's another three right off the top of my head. Uh, who are your best prospects for planned giving? Uh, how to get started in planned giving? Marketing tips for you? Continuing it if you'd like to go deeper in planned giving? And the all-important Q&A, as uh, Stephanie asked you, and I would ask as well, I'll reiterate, please, yeah, put your questions in the chat because that's put the focus where your mind is at. And, you know, I try best to channel what I think you might be asking, uh, wondering about, but you know, I can't do I can't do that perfectly, of course. So please do put your questions in the chat. I love, love the Q&A. And as we go through this, of course, we will be debunking these hateful myths. So the what and why, uh, what is this planned giving? So when people are thinking about making a planned gift and when you're embarking on planned giving fundraising, you're going to be talking to folks who are going to think about how your work fits inside their long-term plans for their dear loved ones. We're talking about uh, today gifts and wills and what that what does that mean? That means that when they make a gift to you that way, that they are putting you alongside their husband, wife, partner, children, and grandchildren. Because those are the people that are in our long-term plans. Our, uh, I say here the, uh, the estate plan and the retirement plan, the, the will being a part of the estate plan. So that's a, that's a big step for someone to take. And so it's important that you be talking to the right people about a planned gift. And we're going to get to that very, very momentarily, who are the best prospects. But that's really what they're thinking about, how your work fits alongside their loved ones in their retirement plan and their estate plan. And for today, the gift that we're going to be focusing on, these are gifts of cash to your nonprofit at the donor's death. There are other types of planned giving, other methods. We're not going to be talking about those. They can be valuable, but we're going to focus on the most popular, the easiest. Uh, so that it's long-term, right? These are all long-term gifts because it's a gift of cash 
uh, at the donor's death. And why do I think plan giving is valuable? Well, hopefully you don't need too much motivation, right? You're already here. We're 66 strong. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you do think it's important, but just, you know, just in case, maybe, maybe a couple of, in case we have any uh, skeptics out there, sustainability. This is all to help the sustainability, the long term for your mission, your work, your values in the long term for your community. However you define community, it might be your local community in Central Texas. Uh, it might be the state of Iowa. It might be the province of Alberta. Whatever it is, however you define community, how important your work is for decades and generations to come in that community. That's your sustainability, right? And planned giving helps that, supports that very well because it helps you to either grow your endowment or launch your endowment. And endowment is that savings account, you know, that we only spend the income of each year and maybe not even all the income in, in some years. But if you have zero endowment, zero, you've got, you've got, you've, you've not got that savings account. I promise you the, the biggest charities you can think of in wherever you are, the biggest ones, um, Let's see, what did we else did we see? Florida, University of Florida. Um, is there a University of Ontario? I think there is a University of Ontario. Um, what else, who else did I say? Arizona, University of Arizona, or the biggest health systems in the country, like Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. They all had zero endowment at some point, right? It's axiomatic. They had to start somewhere. It's not a point of discouragement for you if you don't have an endowment or if you have a small endowment. Planned giving can help you grow that endowment. It's ideal for that. So you don't wanna be discouraged if you're not satisfied with where your endowment is because you're here to learn how to grow that endowment. And if you have an endowment that's robust, planned giving will embellish it, make it even larger. So who are these best prospects, right? Because you want to make sure that you're talking to the right people about a planned gift. These are the people who love your work. They are committed to you. They are your committed, consistent, loyal donors. And that's how you know that they love your work. Because these folks have been giving to you. If your organization has been around for decades, they've been giving to you for decades. And sometimes you'll see people who have given to you for 20, 25 years. And in that, let's say 25 years, you'll see 30, 35 gifts, maybe 40 gifts. They're doing multiple gifts in some years. That's how committed they are. That's how much they love your work. So, and if your nonprofit is not that old and it doesn't need to be, I like to see at least five years in a nonprofit uh, history so that people are comfortable knowing that your work is going to continue after themselves, right? The, the sustainability of your work is pretty, you know, the, uh, is pretty well assured. Um, so I like to see at least five years. And beyond that, you know, I've, of course, there are organizations that are 100 years old. So, you know, you may have people who've been giving to you for 30, 40 years easily, right? It's your consistent, loyal donors. And I like to work with people start talking to uh, folks about planned gifts when they're roughly 55 to 60 and over, okay? And the reason I picked that range is because that's the ages at which people start thinking about their estate plans as a method of giving back to the causes that have been important to them. Now, notice I didn't say that's when they, you start planning your estate and you're thinking about your will. No, that should be many decades earlier, many, especially if they have children. But as a method of giving back, that's roughly the age at which people start thinking about doing that uh, in their, in their long-term plans uh, and, and in their wills specifically. But if you don't have age in your CRM database, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. it it's just like having zero endowment. Don't be discouraged. Not like you can't do planned giving. Not at all. Just use 
giving history as a proxy. Just just go with the giving history. So if you have age, you know, like some um, some uh, universe, well, not necessarily university, some education nonprofits, right? Doesn't matter what level, could be grade schools or high schools or colleges, universities. You know, they may they they will have age. Uh, lots of hospital systems have age. Um, some other some other organizations I've worked with, they just you know, they ask people's birthdays because they like to celebrate the birthdays. That's happens to be a good stewardship idea. If you're if you have the bandwidth to call people or send cards or acknowledge their birthdays each year, it's it's a very good idea to ask what's your birthday. But if you can't do it, you know if you're not going to be able to keep up with it, then then don't ask. Um, so there are organizations that have age, but if you don't, it doesn't matter. Just use the giving history; you'll be fine. Oh, and your board. Before I click away, there, uh, yeah, new fundraising initiative. Right, planned giving. I like to see 100% participation on the board. Some I've worked with some organizations; they don't get there, but that's the goal. I like to see everyone on the board have a gift of some type, and we're talking today about gifts in wills. So, uh, some type of planned gift, though, while they're on the board. What they do after, you know, that's their own choice. But I like to see 100% participation among the board. Because they're your committed volunteers. They're your they're your fiduciaries, right? They're the they're the presumably they are the most loyal to your organization. They 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 devote their time, uh, their talent, and their money, time, talent, treasure, um, and maybe tips and testimonials too. So, you know, they should be the most committed volunteers that you have. So I do think that uh, they should be on board with your new plan giving initiative. Here's our nasty, insidious, hateful, spiteful myth that I can't stand. Number one, the myth that this is only for your wealthy donors. Completely untrue. Absolutely untrue. When I was talking about searching for giving histories, for consistency and loyalty, did I say anything about the size of those gifts? I did not. I don't care if those were $1 gifts. I don't care if they were $5 gifts. I don't care if there's 40 one dollar gifts over 25 30 40 years and that's pretty extreme like one dollar a year but i don't care if you find somebody who fits that hypothetical they are thinking about you so so often they are a very good prospect for a gift in their will so when you're looking for those committed loyal donors don't put any gift size or or minimum lifetime giving history on your on your searches. This is not only for your wealthy donors, not only for your major donors, people of very modest means who make small gifts to you maybe through many, many years, like we're talking about, are terrific prospects for a planned gift. You'd be making a big mistake, you'd be leaving a lot of money on the table if you're only looking at your major donors for planned giving potential. Yeah, you don't wanna make that mistake Myth number one, cut off at the knees. So how do you get started? As I've said, uh, charitable bequests. I've been calling them gifts and wills. They mean exactly the same thing. Charitable bequest means equals gifts in people's wills. And uh, you'll see the, uh, the keen-eyed among you will We'll have noticed that the first letter of each bullet spells out our host today, Kila Labs. Grateful to them again. So we'll uh, shout out to them uh, and uh, did this slide in their honor. So why do you start with charitable bequests? All right. First reason, the average charitable bequest is $35,000. Now that's a U.S. average for our friends in Canada. I'm sure it's equivalent, if not more. Canadians are renowned for being very generous. So I'm be, I'd be very comfortable with you you citing $35,000 too. I'm sure it's right in that ballpark, like I said, if not more. That is the average charitable bequest. And that, to me, that's uh, that's probably a major gift for most or all the folks who are with us right now. Um, so there's one reason. Also, it's easily the most popular planned gift. You should expect throughout your 
nonprofit's history of planned giving, which hopefully is going to launch, uh, you know, I mean, give yourself some time. Today's Thursday, Friday, you might take Fridays off, give yourself the weekend, Monday, some queries in the database. Uh, I'd say, you know, like you should be launching by next Tuesday, starting these uh, planned gift conversations, uh, you know, within a week, easily, easily. So um, most popular planned gift, expect 75% minimum of all your planned gifts through all your nonprofit's history of planned giving going forward to be these simple charitable bequests, gifts and wills. And I've seen it as high as 90%. They are just so easy. Um, they're familiar to people. We're gonna to get to why that is very shortly, next uh, second to last bullet. So the most popular plan gift by far, uh, the low hanging fruit. And uh, those big, those big nonprofit programs that I mentioned earlier, where did I say? University of Florida, University of Arizona, University of uh, Ontario, University of Texas. Name another big Cleveland Clinic. There we go. Uh, another big medical center besides the, the one in New York, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. I assure you, their planned giving programs, I mean, they're robust. You know, they have half a dozen or more people in each one of them doing planned giving fundraising. I assure you, by far, their most popular planned gift is these gifts and wills. So 75% minimum. Expect cash 99% of the time. Yes, I say this because there may be naysayers out there. You know, you're doing your queries on, uh, we say Monday, right? You're going to be querying your database for those committed loyal donors on Monday. And uh, you tell some of the folks in the office or maybe uh, maybe a board member comes by and because some, sometimes the board members can be a little difficult planned giving. Uh, oh, the naysayers, whoever it is, whoever it is, the naysayers, they start whining. Oh, no, we can't do planned giving. We can't ask for gifts and wills. No, because you know what's going to happen? People are going to leave us gifts in their wills that we can't use, like their worthless Hummel collection or their junker cars. It's going to be terrible if we do planned giving. Stop. Stop what you're doing. You can't start the conversations tomorrow on Tuesday. No, no, it's going to be awful. Okay. Aside from these uh, insidious myths, uh, we want to cut these naysayers' arguments off at the knees also. Not the naysayers. Don't cut them off the knees. Their arguments, their naysaying rhetoric, we're going to cut that off. Because you're, the likelihood of you getting something that you cannot use is extraordinarily rare. Low, I should say, right? Stay with it. Likelihood is low. You don't want to say likelihood is rare. I don't think you want to do it that way. The likelihood is low. The possibility, the, the, uh, the uh, what would be rare? The possibility is rare. It's a, it's a low probability. Why am I getting hung up on this? I don't know. I've been doing this for 27 years, since 1997. Easily, 99% of the gifts I've seen are just, it's not 100% because I've seen some other gifts, but they haven't been worthless. The point is, you're going to get gifts of the most, oh my gosh, the easiest resource, the most valuable gift for you to get is going to be gifts of cash. That's what's going to come in people's wills. So please defeat the naysayers. Continue on next Tuesday, starting your conversation. Uh, it's likely you won't be told. That's because for every gift in a will that you find out about, that you that someone tells you, you're in my will, there's another seven to eight folks who also have you in their will, but they're just never going to tell you. It's just too personal, too private for some people. They, they just don't want to share that you're in their will. You're there, but they're just never going to tell you. So another seven to eight for every one that you know about, which is a pretty encouraging ratio. Ask donors to talk to their attorneys. That's if the conversation should start to get technical, like how do, you know, wh which part of my will do I put you in? Does I get outright or is it a percentage, dollar amount or percentage? That's a conversation where you would politely refer them to their attorney because the conversations that you're going to be having with folks are not about wills technicalities. You're going to have conversations with folks about what the two of you, I'm putting you and a donor now, you're having a face-to-face -face meeting with a committed loyal donor and you want to raise this 
possibility of planned uh, a planned gift, a gift in their will, gift we're talking about today, a place to start. Um, and um, you, I lost my spot here now. Oh, what you're talking to them about, thank you, <laughs> sorry. You're talking to them about what you and your donor have in common, your work. You know they love your work because they're committed, loyal donors to it. That's why these are, those are the right prospects to, to, to look for, those committed, loyal donors. You know they love your work. They've been supporting it for a long, long time, could be decades. That's what you have in common with your donors. And that's what the conversation is about. Remember, the sustainability of your work how important your work is in the community, how important it is that that work continue for decades and generations. That's the work, That's the conversation that you are having with your potential planned gift donors, okay? So that's what you're talking about, not technical wills things. And that should also allay some concerns too, right? Um, if you're maybe Gen Z or Gen X or millennial and you're worried about talking to people who are your grandparents or parents' ages about this, you're talking about what you two have in common, your work, okay? So it's not a death conversation, certainly not a death conversation. Absolutely not. It's actually a conversation about life, the life of your nonprofit, the sustainability of your nonprofit for decades and generations. That's what this whole conversation is about. So I focus on that because I know there are concerns there, regardless of age, about you know, how do we talk to people? What are we going to say? I don't know anything about wills. You don't need to. For the next bullet, it's best because it's so easy for your team and your donors. Okay, why don't you need to talk about the technicalities of wills, right? Three things. Everybody knows what wills are. Everybody knows how wills work. And everybody knows they need a will. So why, is that, why does that make gifts and wills easy for your team? You don't have to educate your team about the nuances of charitable remainder unit trust with net income makeup provisions, which is an actual thing. I didn't just string a whole bunch of words together. That actually exists. But you don't have to worry about the nuances of that versus charitable gift annuities. And how does life insurance work and fit in? Everybody knows what wills are. Everybody knows how wills work. Everybody knows they need to have a will. So you don't have to educate your team about planned giving technicalities. And you don't have to educate your donors. You don't have to dedicate marketing time and money to all those things I just described, the charitable remainder unit, remainder unit trust with net income makeup provisions. Wills, wills. Those three features about wills are going to hold you perfectly hold you in good stead. That's why, that was yet another reason why gifts and wills, charitable bequests are the place to start your planned giving fundraising. And so you never need to offer other gift types beyond the wills because of debunked myth number two. The myth being that we have to offer lots of planned gift alternatives, options, oh, there's so much out there. It's, it's legal, it's financial, it's calculators and life income and tax deductions. And uh, this is me channeling more naysaying, right? No, no. You start with gifts and wills and you don't ever have to go any further than gifts and wills. 20 years from now, your nonprofit is still promoting only gifts and wills. Right, You will have captured at least 75% of the gifts that you would have gotten if you had offered the other gift options. Because I assure you, right, that's the minimum. 75% of all the planned gifts are going to be gifts and wills. So you don't need to go further if you don't want to. If you do want to, you can in the future, out years. But take comfort knowing you don't need to. So nasty myth number two, you do not have to offer lots of gift options now or ever. Are these slides too subtle? Is, is this message coming through okay? You can read that all right? You know, it's the mirroring and everything? It's, it's not too subtle. Okay, okay. I didn't think so. And coming on the heels of number two, of course, 
that uh, it's it's corollary that plan giving is too technical. No, it's going to be so hard for us. All the reasons I just described, you don't have to teach your team and you don't have to teach your donors. Remember those three features of wills. You're probably getting tired of me reciting them. So I'm not going to recite them, uh, whether it be a third or fourth time. You got them down. Everybody knows what wills are. Everybody knows how wills work. Everybody knows they need a will, just in case you need a re refresher. All right. It's not technical when you start smart. Gifts and wills. So this is where we are so far. Uh, we've, uh, you know, the what and why, the best prospects, how to get started. Okay. And we've debunked three of these uh, top five insidious myths. This is straight up vodka, by the way. Uh, it's not, not water. And we got a little more to do. Myth number four, we're knocking them off. Plan giving requires a lot of money. Close corollary to numbers one through three, especially correlated to numbers two and three, I would say. It does not require a lot of money. I'm about to give you a bunch of marketing strategies that are low lift, low cost. So myth number four, cut off at the knees. Let's start with some of those marketing ideas. Events. You might be drafting the speaking points or somebody else might be. You can put a few lines in and literally a few lines, a few sentences about how easy it is for folks to include you in their will. Um, and you can do the same in your in the sidebar for your uh, for your program. With, with, uh, I'm sorry, in the pro do the same in the program for your event. What did I say? In the sidebar for your program? No, you want to use a sidebar in the program for your event. Some misplaced uh, prepositions there. Sorry. Well, and the subjects were wrong too. So um, it's as easy as some uh, along these lines. You all, you all know how important it is. This is your speaker because you've drafted concise speaking points for gifts and wills for the for your speak, next speaker. Um, you all know how important our, our work is to the community. Uh, you, you wouldn't be here if you didn't recognize how essential we are uh, for the community. And it's essential that our work continue you know, for decades and generations. And we're starting to focus on that now. And in focusing on that, we're encouraging long-term gifts. We're encouraging our, we're encouraging all of you to include us in your wills. It's so simple to do. It's easy for you to add us in and we'd be grateful. And it's important to the, our, to our sustainability. And you know, you might put in a couple sentences about the work that you do specifically, right? And that's it. So maybe it's a minute, 90 seconds, right? Low lift, easy. And you could even shorten that side, shorten that into a sidebar and put it in your program. Okay, there we go. Print. Uh, so now we're, we're uh, in print. Sidebars, oh, sidebars, sidebars of articles. Look, talk about, talk about uh, mistakes. This is egregious. That's supposed to be sidebars or articles, or I believe Keila is going to send you a survey. Uh, if they do, you should flag this. Slide number 12. The guy, uh, he was a nice guy, but I, you know, I can't really remember his name. But uh, you know, he had a mistake on slide 12. Egregious. All right, let, let's try to overcome that. Try, try, please try to forgive me. Look past that. Sidebars or articles in your newsletter and your annual report. Uh, I'm a big fan of the sidebars because the sidebar... It's like 40, 50 words, right? Articles, 250, 300 words. The, the uh, I'm looking up like, you know, I'm thinking about trying to get an article approved up the chain. No, that's supposed to be a comma, not a semicolon. Why, why did you put a semicolon there? But everybody knows that should be a comma. Versus uh, sidebars. So much easier to get approved, so much quicker to draft, right? Okay, so I prefer the sidebars, but if you're tasked, uh, to write an article, I hope you're not, but uh, you don't need it. You don't need it. So sidebars or articles in whatever, you know, whatever print channels you've got. Your annual report, if you're recognizing other donors, you know, at different giving levels in your annual report. And uh, believe me, I understand the agony of that. Uh, do we have the spelling right? I, I know that's how it is in the CRM, but, but didn't she email us and tell us that we've had it wrong for 
12 years we've been misspelling her name. No, no, wait, she doesn't use the MD after her name. She no, but does it no, but he does. No, but this couple, they want to be listed separately. But this other couple wants to be listed as a couple, but but it's not Mr. and Mrs. Uh, so I I uh I've sat in those meetings around a conference table um and and agonized over those details. But if you're doing that, going through that exercise for your other donors then you certainly should be doing the same for your planned giving donors, right? You shouldn't exclude them. It's just simple stewardship if you're doing it for all the others. And you would be inviting other people to, to join them as well to, uh, with a gift uh, in, in their wills. Uh, digital uh, repurposed sidebars. Yes, please. Um, again, sidebars, so much easier. Um, a simple page on your website so the repurpose is, you know, any digital channels you've got, uh, use those, reuse those sidebars. Um, simple page on your website. Yeah, you know, one page is usually sufficient, maybe two. I'll give you two. You don't need more than that. You don't need to pay these companies that are charging like $750 a quarter and they have plan giving encyclopedias and all the calculators that I mentioned before, the, the income calculator and the tax calculator and, and people can do research on, the nuances and the intricacies of the different methods of plan giving, you don't need to pay for all that. You don't need it because you're focusing on simple gifts and wills, right? Don't worry, I'm not going to recite the three features of wills again. I know you were thinking, oh my God, he's going to say it again. I'm not. Um, but what's so, so what does belong on your simple page or maybe two, uh, some pull quotes from donors who have done this, who have included you in their will, pull quote, you know, short uh, about uh, how, easy it was for them to do or how much they value your work, maybe picture, a picture or two of a donor, donor couple, things like that. Certainly want a couple sentences about the importance of your work in the community and how important it is that that work be sustainable. Um, and then maybe a contact person, you know, that's it. And remember that contact person, they're not going to be talking about technicalities of wills. They're going to be talking, if they get a call or an email, they're going to be talking about the importance of the sustainability of your work in the community and how valuable these long-term gifts are to that. That's what they're gonna be talking about. So you're not setting your person up for, uh, your contact person up for conversations they can't handle. That They would just refer to the, refer the donors to their attorneys for anything technical. And finally, quick, uh, easy, uh, anybody could put in their email signature that uh, you can include us in your will, and it's easy. And maybe, you know, maybe that links to the page on your website. Uh, direct mail. So now here I'm envisioning direct mail that's devoted to some other purpose, not planned giving devoted. So drop a buck slip in whatever package, you know, for whatever purpose you're mailing. Um, and the buck slip by buck slip, I mean something that gets printed three on a page. Now, three on a page. What looks like three on a page? What looks like a third of a page? A sidebar. Rehash those sidebars. Wait, re, uh, it's, it's not rehash. It's, rehash is not so good. Rehash is kind of, that sounds a little negative, a little pejorative, rehash. Sounds like, oh, they're going over it again. Repurpose, that's what you want to do. You don't want to rehash. You want to repurpose. So repurpose those sidebars, make them into a buck slip. You're dropping a third of a page into your mail package. It doesn't change the postage costs. No increase in postage. Simple, third of a page. Maybe it's a different color to bring attention to it, but that's it, Dif easy. And uh, my other suggestion here, use your reply envelope flaps for self-selection checkoff. What do I mean there? The next time you do a big order of reply envelopes. Now in the States, uh, this won't apply, this cannot apply to the BREs, the business reply envelopes that have that postage indicia on there because the U.S. Postal Service is very uh, fastidious. Let's work, let's work the word fastidious in. Scrupulous. That's another good word. Let's work that in too. They're fastidious and scrupulous about what goes on their business reply envelopes. You know, the ones with the, the marketing, right, with the postage or the bars. So um, you wouldn't be able to do it on those. But if you have other types of reply envelopes, you know, they're pre-addressed back to you. Then on the flap, you on the envelope flap, you have printed, because you're already doing the run of envelopes anyway. 
you have printed a little checkoff box. Please send me information on including your organization's name in my will. That's it. They check a box as they're as they're sealing the envelope. So um, then when, of course, the envelopes come back, you know, whoever opens your mail needs to know that they're supposed to bring to you the flaps. Well, the, yeah. <laughs> here's a stack of envelope flaps. Uh, oh, no, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't tell me to save the envelopes or preserve the name of the person who did the checkoff. You, you just said save the envelope flaps. Here, I got I got 20 envelope flaps with people check them off. <laughs> okay, worthless. So, uh, you know, don't just save the envelope flaps, save the envelopes uh, too. Uh, and you need to know uh, who they came from as well. So person that's opening your envelopes, they need to flag these people for you because they, they've self-identified as having an interest in a gift in their will. So they've, they're a prospect, right? They've self-identified. And then finally at the bottom, if your budget allows, because direct mail is expensive, but if your budget allows for mail that's devoted to planned giving, it still does very well. Uh, I do a lot of direct mail for clients that I work with. When you're sending mail to these committed loyal donors, they open it. Your mail is not junk mail to these folks, right? We we realize now this is not a donor acquisition program that we're embarking on. Uh, you all realize that. So uh, direct mail does very well if your budget allows. But I've given you lots of other strategies, tips for, you know, that are not as costly as direct mail, not even close. And our final myth, oh, that planned giving that hurt our other fundraising. Yes, I'm channeling the naysayers again. Oh, our annual fund is gonna suffer. Our major gifts are gonna suffer. Our sustainers are gonna take away their monthly giving because they're gonna put us in their will and cut us off. And then we're not gonna see anything until they've died. Okay, naysayer, sorry. Well, I'm not even really very sorry. Uh, I, I, I don't have a lot of tolerance for the naysayers in any, in any forum, uh, in any topic the people who look for why we can't instead of how and why we can. So I don't have a lot of tolerance for them. Uh, so uh, I'm not so sorry. We're cutting your argument off at its knees, they say, -er, because I've got anecdotes and I've got quantitative research. I've been doing plan giving for 27 years, since 1997. I have seen thousands of people through those years who have told a nonprofit that they have that nonprofit in their will, and then they have increased, increased their other giving. Now, why might somebody do that? What have they done when they put you in their will? Who are they along? Who are you alongside in their will? The donor's husband or wife or partner, children, grandchildren, and maybe even dear friends. Sometimes really good friends are in our wills. They've elevated you to that level. They feel pretty close to you. And so they increase their other giving. They do not decrease. Lots of people. I've seen it thousands of times. All right, you might say, well, let, let's move on to the research because Tony Martinetti, uh, I think that was his name. I, I'm not sure, you know, but whatever. This is something long. And, uh, he just had a bunch of anecdotes, he, 27 years of anecdotes. What am I going to do with anecdotes? 27 years, eh, you know, it's better than 15, but okay. You don't like the anecdotes? Then I refer you to the research of Professor Russell James at Texas Tech University. Uh, I wonder if Texas Tech is in Central County. No, uh, Texas Tech is not that far east, no. So Texas Tech University, Professor Russell James, his research topics are all around planned giving fundraising. He studied hundreds of nonprofits and in those nonprofits, when someone told that nonprofit that they had included the organization in their will, on average, 75% of the people who did that and said it to the nonprofit increased their other giving to that same nonprofit, 75%. So you've got 27 years of anecdotes from Tony Martinetti, and you've got the quantitative research from Professor Russell James. It's not going to hurt your other fundraising. Naysayer, go away. I don't have a lot of tolerance for the naysayers. So this is where we've been, folks. We've debunked those hateful, spiteful, insidious myths. 
along with everything else there. I've got uh, a couple of suggestions if you want to learn more about planned giving, if you want to go deeper. And then the all important Q&A, I see chat 12. Uh, I hope a lot of those are questions. Please put those questions in the chat. So for continuing ed, if you like to read hardcover books, because I'm not sure this was digital because it's been around for a long time, uh, but it's a very good, simple book on planned giving. Planned giving simplified. It's aptly named. Robert Sharp Sr. It's a very good book. Uh, I have a free how-to guide. Unleash the game-changing power of planned giving at your nonprofit. It goes into more detail on some of what we talked about today. Uh, someone left a comment on LinkedIn today that it's that it was that it was excellent. It was he he said it was concise, valuable. So just snap that QR code if you would like to get the free download of my how-to guide. Uh, and uh, if you want to go even deeper, work with me. I have a course called Planned Giving Accelerator. In three months, March, April, and May. So we're done by the end of May. It's not going to cut into your summer plans. Over three months, I will guide you step-by-step step how to launch planned giving at your nonprofit. We'll meet once a week for an hour on Zoom in a meeting format. Meeting, not webinar format. So everybody's talking, not at the same time. It's not anarchy. It's planned giving accelerator, not planned giving anarchy. So... Um, People are helping each other. They're providing ideas, you know, bouncing ideas off each other because, you know, like peer support grows as the group gets more and more cohesive week after week. So if that sounds appealing to you, um, the information is at plannedgivingaccelerator.com. And because you joined this Kilo webinar, you can use the code there in the last bullet of the last slide, Kilo 1500, and you can claim $1,500 off your uh, tuition at the Plan Giving Accelerator in January, if you join in January. And again, we're getting started in early March together. So I'll leave that QR code just a couple seconds. And Stephanie, do we have questions in the chat? We do. Great. Thank you so much, Tony. That was amazing. Uh, we do, yeah, we do a few questions here. So first one from Cheryl, um, do planned gifts always go to endowments? Is this the preferred vehicle for planned gifts? That's the first Cheryl, question. thank you for your question. Um, what I recommend is that as much as possible of your planned gifts go into endowment. I say that with comfort because most of the gifts in wills are unrestricted unrestricted gifts, probably more than three quarters, unrestricted dollars coming in. So when they do come, I urge you to put as much as possible into that endowment. Now, I understand, of course, there are immediate concerns, uh, immediate deadlines. We got to keep the lights on and the people paid and the rent, whatever. But as much as possible, put those unrestricted gifts in wills uh, into endowment. Amazing. So next question here is from Laura. One okay. thing one their organization uh, has debated is recognition. How how is the sorry, how sorry, how strongly do you recognize gifts we haven't received yet compared to the potential smaller major gifts we have received? Example, donor signatures. Um and who is that from? This is from Laura. Laura, okay, thank you, Laura. Um stewardship, yeah. So you want to have a recognition society for your planned giving donors. Um, anybody who has told you that they've included you in their will, or they've checked a box on a reply card from a mailing that says they've included you, or they just pulled you aside and, you know, mentioned it in an event or something. Um, you know, those, po those folks all belong, belong in your planned giving recognition society. And then you want to, what do you want to do with that recognition society? You want to treat those folks like, you know, insiders. Maybe if you have some communications, that you only share with major donors. Why not Why not uh, expand that to your planned giving donors as well, to that recognition society? So, you know, and then as the society grows, you know, maybe you could host an event, but, you know, that would be the out years when you have a lot of people who have made these commitments, told you that they're, that they have you in their wills. Um, but yeah, you want to have a recognition society. You want to steward those folks. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I have another question from John here. Do we need documentation of people putting our nonprofit in their will? 
Great question, John. Thank you. That is purely a in, an institutional decision. Uh, I've seen both sides. Um, some organizations like to give a, a simple document. It's it's completely non-binding legally. It's not going to guarantee that the will gift it will be there. People can change their minds, but hardly anybody does it. Don't worry about that. It's like the last statistic I saw was like 4% of people who have a charitable request change their mind. So 96% of people don't. But um, to your question, John, um, some organizations will give a simple non-binding form. You know, what? please share what you'd like about our gift, uh, about your gift, uh, what you want to share with us. Others, completely hands off. You've told us, you checked a box, that's good enough. You sent us an email letting us know, you know, we preserve the communication if it, if it was that way and save it in the CRM database, but other organizations don't. So it's really, it's purely institutional. I, 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 could, I could see it both ways. Uh, if you ask what my preference is, my preference is to not have a form, but lots of charities that I work with have had forms through the years. So we have a question here from, it just came in from Eric. You mentioned repeat donors are better prospects than major donors. I need to start a plan giving program with a small nonprofit with hundreds, not thousands of supporters, most of them who are low income. So I'll definitely be engaging with them about plan giving. But how can I start prospecting beyond our low, uh, small, low income support base? Well, yeah, it's not that major donors aren't. Who is this question from? Uh, Eric. Eric, thank you. Uh, Eric, it's not that major donors are bad prospects. It's just that major donors aren't your only prospects. So you have, if you have consistent loyal donors, you know everything I said about their lifetime giving history, those average gifts, that all applies. You know, if their average gift is five dollars, and they've been doing it for a long time, then they're a good prospect for you uh, for a planned gift. Um, how do you go beyond the consistent loyal donors? Uh, you, I don't think you should. Uh, you should just work with those folks who love your work that much. Otherwise, you're getting into you know, question, you know, you, you, the gifts are going to be a lot less likely from the more sporadic donors, even if they're major donors. So I think you should work with the work with the prospects that you have. However few that might be, those are your plan giving prospects through the years, you know, maybe in a couple of years, query again for loyalty again. Um, well, maybe not a couple of years, you don't have to wait that long, but because maybe there are some people who make multiple gifts in a year. So but, you know, it, I want you to stick with the folks who are most likely, those, those most likely prospects. So we Thanks, had, Eric. Yeah, so we had a pre-submitted question here um, from Sue. How do you overcome the response of, uh, it's a great idea, but we'll think about you in the future in response to inviting a person about making a planned gift? Uh, I would thank them very much for considering it for the future. Um, and then I would go back to them I don't know, maybe in a year, you know, I, I would not make, I would not keep them on the active prospect list uh, in terms of personal, you know, personal solicitations. Uh, if you're doing other, uh, if you're doing other campaigns, you know, whether digital or print around planned giving, I would keep them in. They didn't say no, they didn't say never, they just said not now. So I would thank them for all the, all the support that they've done that, that led to their conversation because you know, they're a committed loyal donor. So I would thank them for all that. And I would thank them for considering it for the future. And then I'd follow up and I'd, I'd probably calendar that for a year or so. Amazing. I but, think, I, but I'd keep them on the prospect list in the meantime. So I okay. think it's time for one more question here. Okay, one more. Um, so what tools do we need financially in order to receive plan gifts? I don't feel like I know uh, what to ask for and when and how we would then receive them, basically. Sorry. Uh, you don't when you're keeping this simple gifts and wills and that's that's the focus you don't need anything special you, you need your you'll need your savings and checking accounts so that you can cash checks when they come I, i'm sure you already have those um you don't need any other special tools not for the simple gifts and wills so that another reason why wills are the place to start you don't need uh, the the calculators and the the apps you know and the gifts and wills you don't you don't need any special tools just a just a method of receiving gifts of checks when they come at, 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 uh, as as those plan giving donors die 
That's you know that that's the that's the way the gift will come. It will come as a gift of cash, in, as a check. And I like to end on this note here for webinars. Um, what is the one thing you want people to take away from this webinar? Oh, there's probably five things. All the five things. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, don't be don't be intimidated by planned giving. Don't be put off. Don't keep it at arm's length. It's not a black box. It's easy, accessible, and affordable when you start smartly. And that guide that I that I had the QR code for will help you. And if you want to go even further, Plan Giving Accelerator, I'll help you even more. Just don't be don't be put off by plan giving. It's easy, accessible. It's in your reach. Amazing. Yeah. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tony. Um, Thanks, I'll, write, every, I'll, every, I'll write everyone. That concludes our session for today. And thank you, Tony, again. And thank you for everyone for joining here. Before I go, I just want everyone to know there's going to be a very short survey at the end that will pop up after the session. It only takes about 20 seconds to complete. And we'll greatly appreciate hearing your feedback. So hope you all fill that out. Um, also, we uh, have our next webinar that's coming out next week on January 25th called Prospect Research and Practice, Identifying and Researching Funders and Major Gift Prospects. So we hope we all see you then. So thanks again, everyone, and see you our next webinar. You can also check out our website, kilo.co, and talk to sales about anything in the future. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks. Bye, bye. everybody.